Hi. Good morning. Uh, today we're going to be looking at effectiveness of machine learning in K through 12 Chromebooks, um, a project I've been working on for a little bit here. Um, my name is John Crossan. I've been working in various roles on databases for the past 20 years. Um, I should probably a bit over that. I've been a data architect for the past 10. I'm not really a data scientist, but I do support them. And I'm also the uh, leader of the Vivid Vertica Special Interest Group. Um, these live sessions are being recorded and recordings are available to all Vivid members. Um, if you need technical support during this, um, please click on the feedback section and somebody will um, get on that for you if, if you can't hear or can't see, et cetera. And um, there's a questions tab, so please feel free to submit questions as we go along and we'll answer them as they come up rather than just do them all at the end. Um, so we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, back when I was going to school, this was essentially the technology we had. Um, and it was a technology that would get confiscated by your teachers if you, you know, left them, left them on or had them too loud. But today, um, various schools are actively promoting using technologies, um, uh, iPads, Chromebooks, uh, Windows machines, et cetera. And our project um, we were working on was with um, a, a couple different school districts across the United States. And the commonality between these would be they have machines that are stored in each classroom. So these are, are not machines that students take home at the end of, at the, end of the day and they don't even leave the room. So they'll go ahead and log on to that machine during that class, do whatever the teacher hopefully instructs them to do, and then put the machine back on the rack at the end of the class. Um, so you know, the, the first kind of question we got asked for the school districts were, how can we tell if we have enough machines and do we have the machines in the, the places they need to be, um, mainly classrooms, and then as a follow-up, we have these here, the students are using them, are they using them the way that we're intending them to use them? So that this really started off as a reporting project to try to um, you know, get some answers for that. So um, an initial kind of tactical goal again was determine inventory needs. So if there is a classroom that has 30 machines, we wanna make sure there's, during no point during the day, there's more than 30 students uh, registered in that machine and conversely if we have 30 machines in a classroom but there's never more than 20 students in that classroom we have 10 spares and those spares can be redistributed to other rooms that may need them rather than purchasing new machines which um, they had previously been doing so it, it's really to you know help help the school save money and make sure that each student has what they need so these um, these slideshows or the um, screenshots we're going to show of some reports are of actual um, actual reports for the school district. Obviously, we've removed any any names, and um, th this first report really just shows um, by location which rooms are under over utilized with actual machines. Um, and the idea is, you know, again, just to help with inventory. And then we have this kind of a slightly different view of this based on individual classrooms. So the, the, the second kind of goal that we talked about were, okay, students have, um, have these machines. What are they clicking on? How much time do they spend on a given site? And, you know, again, are they, you know, doing educational work or are they going to sites maybe they shouldn't be going, even though obviously the schools have firewalls and block a lot of sites. There's always new things pop up that you can't count on. So, you know, we came up with a report based on uh, students logged into a machine. So we know who the student is. We know what the machine is. And then we track, um, then, we, then we track through, um, you know, click. Um, mechanisms to see which websites those students were going to. So, you know, here in this classroom as an example, they were primarily using the machines for instructional use, which is what they're looking for. And then um, for, for paid content, school districts will purchase um, software packages um, 
that either supplement books or are in lieu of books. So, you know, part of it is determining um, kind of an ROI. We're, you know, purchasing this content. Uh, we're purchasing these license, licenses. Are they being are they being used? And then finally, we want to also look at this really across not just on the school level or class level, but individual how individual teachers are using these things, how departments are using them. Um, you know, who, who's using them more? So, if, you know, two teachers are um, instructing uh, algebra two class, if one teacher is using it a lot, maybe one teacher is using it less. It might be an opportunity to let the instructor who's using it less speak to the person using it more and try to get some better um, insights how to use these more effectively. So you know, we can kind of see on the screenshot, um, uh, you know, the the usage for the sum for these classes. And then here's the second one showing that really looked a little bit like the other ones, but are a little bit more geared towards usage. And, and I, I, these um, slides are available as an attachment or, or link if you wanted to uh, view them later. I know we're going through the going through the reports fairly quickly. Um, so th th that was really the, the crux of the project. And but there are limits to reporting. And in this case, there are obviously an virtually an infinite number of domains that students can click on. There's a large number of students across an entire school district, large number of classes. A uh, fair amount of schools, and um, you know it, it's hard to determine trends on just based on these reports. So th these tactical reports are, are definitely very useful and help um, with some of the things we we described as far as making sure that um, machines are where they need to be, and um, and how they're being used. But it, it's really you know too much data to look on a report. So one you know good example of this is here's um, for a particular um, class. Here's a list of domains that students clicked on, and here's the top 20. But if you look over at the pie chart, um, the top 20 is this little sliver, and everything else is other. So um, I, I believe when we did a count on this, there were well over 100,000 different domains or base domains uh, clicked. So you know anything with Google.com on it counts as one domain, even though there, there's obviously a virtually unlimited number of Google. Google domains, subdomains, and subpages that you could go hit. And um, I'll, I'll just pause here for a second. And again, if anyone has any questions they want to throw in, you know, feel free to do it, and we'll answer as we go along. So, um, so the, these these tactical goals um, were, were definitely a good help and a good starting point, but you know they're. There, there's obviously limits to that. So, um, so you know, here's where machine learning comes into play. So we w wanted to look at patterns on how um, how these machines are being utilized. We want to try to predict future usage, um, both of machines themselves, if, um, to try to anticipate for budgeting, and then also the usage of how students were actually clicking on these things. And then finally. Um, Finally, you know how how effective are these? Um, you know the outcome is obviously a set of grades. You know, can we help determine how effective um, not not just as a whole, but individual software packages um, or individual teachers are using these to you know, hopefully get better outcomes for their students? So um, you know, again, some more some more use cases that kind of got thrown our way were you know how can we see patterns on what students are clicking, how do different teachers in the same subject differ in machine usage, and how frequently is the paid content being used? So um, I'll, I'll pause here for a second and talk about some of the the tool sets we use for this. Um, for the, the reports that we've seen so far, um, SQL Server was the back end that, that was already pre existing um, in most places and used to collect data for the reports. Um, the reports we've seen so far had, were generated in Cognos um, that, that was already pre existing with some of the other school software they had. Um, and then we're using Tableau for the um, sort of the machine learning um, visualizations that we'll be looking at here shortly. 
Um, for the back end, for the machine learning and analytics, uh, we went with Vertica, um, really for a few reasons. It can be deployed either on premise or in the cloud, and in some cases with the, um, the school districts, they required things to be on premise. Others are fine with things going in the cloud. Um, there's really a good selection of machine learning functions already built into the software. So beyond some of the, the base ones that we're going to be setting up for them, um, they can go ahead and do, um, you know, create their own analytics as they go forward without, you know, having to write R code or, you know, you know Python or, or whatever, um, you end up using it. And it, it's very fast for returning these results. So one of the first things we went through were, was domain clustering, and we, we ended up using k-means for this. So the, the idea is showing, um, showing a cluster of domains being used by various departments. And um, you know, again, the, this data is live from, um, this data is live. So what we had to do is um, you know, kind of dumb down these reports a little bit to, to show them so that they may not be as, as Quite as clear as they would be. Um, in any case, um, they're they're filtered by department. They're able to be filtered by individual classes, and they could also be drilled down um, through the the clusters. Which in this case, a cluster is really a department and a set of domains. And we'll take a look at that. And you know, again, I apologize. We had to strip so much off of this. It's a little bit hard to read, but um, we can see on top here's a department. And then which we changed into cluster names, and then down below here's various domain names, and there, there's some filters to get up to this point to grill, get down to a grouping of domains, or a, um, either based on usage or um, kind of a class of domain. Um, and you know, a class of domain could be you know like Google as a search engine, or it could be a you know the school district website, etc. So you know, one of the keys, obviously, for the domain clustering is the, the, the underlying data needs to be correct and clean um, using some of the internal Vertica machine learning functions. We're able to write it in one short statement. And um, you know, to go to the fast part of this is we, we, can run this, um, we can run this model in three seconds over about 40 million records um, from the first, and this was back from the first couple of weeks of school. So, um, I, I put the statement, and this was the exact statement we ran that generated the output data for um, this report back here. And then kind of a, a next step was to try to um, do some um, linear regression and RF clustering. And really the idea of that is to try to get some probabilities of students uh, clicking on a particular domain. Um, you know, again, we wanted to filter by department, filter by class, and drill down um, to various clusters and domains. And th 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 this is really for a, a few reasons. One is to, to try to find trending in which um, domain usages are trending upwards or, or downwards. Um, also, again, you, even though the school district has, um, or the school districts have pretty um, robust security features to you know, make sure students go to sites they really shouldn't go to. There's, you know, with, with the internet, obviously, there's new sites popping up all the time. So to try to get some trending on domains that are outside of the educational area that maybe should um, be put on the firewall. So this, um, again, I apologize for having to, to strip this down so much, and it may be a, a bit hard to read, but it's really trying to cluster and um, do probabilities. And in this case, it's down to the teacher level. Um, and that this was for a particular set of students um, in a particular grouping of classes using particular domains. And um, to try to get some probabilities of which domain um, was trending up and which domain was trending down. Um, and again, I apologize, we had to strip all the names off of this, so it makes it a, a bit harder to read. But, um, you know, again, to, to get this to work properly, it's, you know, making sure the data is correct and clean. Um, we ran a combination of three different models, which we'll show that code on the next screen. 
and you know, running these three models you know, took about 40 seconds to generate this data over the same you know, 40 million record set. And you know, kind of thinking about what we have to do or what the various points we have to analyze, uh, that's actually pretty good um, based on you know, a combination of teachers, um, domains, um, instructional and instructional use. And again, here's the three lines of code. Um, we were able to run Vertica that generated the output data for that report. So some some future use cases that we're you know in the still in the in the development stage on are to you know tie the outcomes to grades and we'll, we'll talk a, a bit more about this um a bit more about this later but you know that that is a little little bit tricky because you have different um different things you have to factor in um, you have different teachers you have different subjects you have different schools you have a different makeup of classes and students. So just because an, an outcome with one teacher may be better than another, that could be due to the teacher, but it could also be due to the class. Um, just the, the luck of the draw of which students, you know, maybe a math teacher, a um, just happened to get a class of, you know, 15 out of the 20 kids in that class were already really good at math and five not so much, and then teacher B might have the exact opposite, 15 students that necessarily aren't that um, great at math and five that are. So, you know, trying to, um, trying to really determine what, try to narrow this, trying to narrow this down to, you know, how software packages are used and how machines are used gets a little bit tricky because of all these um, different variables that we have to account for. So that, that would be things like looking at past grades, looking at uh, test scores, looking at, um, you know, just looking at various things with the students to try to um, apply a score to each student, whether they're whether they may or may not be um, inclined to do better in this class or not, uh, versus others, and then also then roll that up into um, determining how the machines are being utilized, how software packages are being utilized, and then also um, looking at the teachers themselves. Um, and math might not be the best example of it because questions are generally right or wrong, but if you're looking at a subject like English where, um, or language arts, where it might be a little bit more subjective as far as um, as far as grades, and trying to weight how you know, teachers grade to start with, and then also to measure this against um, standardized tests, um, makes that a, a bit of a tricky um, a tricky thing to do. So that's you know kind of one of the one of the next steps we're doing, and then. Also, you know, trying to find out, you know, what is the ROI again of this instructional data, and a lot of the same types of things apply that um, we just talked about with um, outcomes, um, you know, different differences in teacher schools, et cetera, um, and then incorporate more types of machine learning data elements so that that would just be bringing in additional data that may help explain explain results. Um, and a lot of that is just finding data sets that you think might be remotely useful against against outcomes and try to determine if there are correlations um, if there are correlations that may or may not happen um, happen and then you know finally really identify teachers using the devices most effectively and um, you know that that will allow the schools to um, you know have those teachers do kind of a train the trainer type thing um, to you know hopefully improve the educational experience for as many students as possible. So I'm, I'm going to pause here for just a second. Um, Parks gone through this a little bit quickly than I had thought, and we're getting towards the end quite early. Um, but so I would like to, you know, ask if anyone does have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them, and um, we'll make sure to get to them. So um, some some of the you know main lessons we learned for this is, you know, obviously basic reporting is important, and there are trends. Um, 
not not just in education, but you know, just in in general in the business intelligence world, you know, towards machine learning, but and you know, basic reporting may be um you know pushed to the back, but it it, it really is important. So that some some of the earlier reports we looked at for you know just basic is there enough are there enough machines in this class given the number of students that are in this room throughout the day, are you know that that that's really what you need for that. Um, so you know you can definitely get some good insights, and then also by analyzing reporting, you can help determine what questions need to be answered, um, and determine if they can be answered into a report, or if you need to use more advanced techniques, whether it's um, machine learning or predictive or AI or wh whatever the case may be. Um, you, you have to have something to start um, getting those questions asked. And, and probably the, the, the most critical thing is really having trust in the data or having the end users have trust in the data. Um, if, if you're running basic reports and, for example, we're showing, oh, this, this class never has more than 20 students in and somebody looks and says, no, in third period English, there's you know, 28 students in here, um, you, you really lose trust in the data. And if, if that's not right, when you go to run you know, machine learning al algorithms or w whatever you end up doing with the data, that, that's not going to be right, right either. So it's also a good way to verify uh, your data is correct. And you know, keep in mind, if people don't re re trust your basic reports, if you can't do basic counts or, um, or you know, have, the, have the, the base layer of that done, and you go show this great analytics platform, most likely they're not going to trust that and, and they really shouldn't because it's on the same set of data. And um, anyone working with you know, various clients or internal or external will know that you know, trust, particularly with data, is very hard to gain to, get, to convince them that this data is correct, especially if some of the answers um, skew away from any preconceived notions. Um, that, that trust is very easy to lose by giving somebody a bad number, and then it's also very difficult to get back once you show them a poor number, so or a, a number that's incorrect. So, you know, really, a key is to make sure that um, when we go through these these more basic reports, that we have that really locked down, and everyone agrees this data is correct. And then you'll have um, better buy-in for advanced, um, more advanced analytics type projects and people most likely act on, on the results that you're getting. And then kind of another key is the data modeling is still very important. Um, it, it's, it's easy in a platform like, like, like using like Vertica, for example, but you can also use like Snowflake or Redshift or whatever, or Google BigQuery. They're, they're fast platforms and you can throw data up there and all kinds of bad data models and they'll perform shockingly pretty well, but um, o over time that performance is going to degrade and it also um, helps affect your um, data integrity, um, you know, with the poor data model. So, you know, that, that was one of the initial, you know, things we had to do for the basic reporting was we, we got this data in, you know, some big flat files that were semi third form normal but not really and convert that data into a snowflake schema. So at that point we know we're getting good performance. We know that if we need to get this piece of data, it's in this place and this place only and we're delivering the, the single version of the truth. But And then through uh, testing and QA and validation, we're also ensuring that the data is correct. And, and I guess another note on that is that as we went through this, we discovered issues in, in the source systems where they were incorrectly reporting data and it gave the clients opportunities to go fix that with um, you know, schedules that weren't necessarily aligned to reality. So with um, pr predictive and machine learning, um, we, we can gain some valuable insights, um, but the, the key to this is we always have to really take in the, the human factor, especially when humans are the subject. So here we're trying to run analytics based on what humans are doing. And humans obviously are unpredictable. And if we're talking about American high school teenagers, that they're, that's kind of the pinnacle of unpredictability. So, um, you know, even though, you know, these analytics and insights and predictions may um, 
may be technically accurate from using, you know, in terms of using algorithms or making sure the data is correct, there, there obviously still has to be some human involvement to say does this make sense based on based on what we know through our you know years of being educational for, um, professionals. And then also obviously with schools, there's a heavy um, regulatory aspect on top of that. So machine learning or predictive could indicate go do this, but you know they can't. <laughs> um, and then it you know it really promotes the discussion of solutions, um, but it's not intended obviously to be the decision maker. Um, and that it kind of follows what, what, what I said. You're doing analytics with unpredictable actions and trying in multiple unpredictable actions um, you know the students and the teachers um, you know the the class itself and the, the physical environment may be different from class A to class B um, you know it, it, it lets you um, experiment with different inputs and try to find answers even when there are no questions so you know some things we've talked about is you know ha does you know weather affect anything so it's you know, pulling weather data is a, you know, a cloudy, cold day or a scorching hot day. Does that do anything? Maybe it does, maybe it not. Doesn't, who knows? Um, you know, we can pull, pull in any number of really sources of data and try to determine correlations and really do, do anything that will give, um, will give the principal, the teachers, department heads, you know, some chance to determine what's happening, um, you know, different times of the day, does, you know, like earlier classes, later classes, et, et cetera. Um, then finally realizing, you know, these types of projects are really never done. Um, you know, some of the reporting parts might be generally done as far as, okay, we've got the inventory kind of dialed in and they understand what that is, but, you know, there, there are always going to be you know, new questions and new opportunities to try to find some insights. And, and a lot of that, the, the, this last point really goes back to um, what I was discussing earlier with, with the data modeling is just to make sure that we have a good framework. So in, in this case, so it's a snowflake schema and if we want to bring in additional data sources, um, you know, from a logical model and from a physical model standpoint, we have a place to, to pull that data in. We'll get good performance and we'll make sure that we're getting, um, getting um, accurate results. So with that, I know we um, kind of cut this a little bit short. I believe that's the last slide we have. So. Um, you know, I am, I'm free to answer any questions um, anyone might have uh, for this presentation or for um, using technology in schools in general. Here, I'll pause here for just one second. So we did have um, a question here on the, the frequency of data. So in, in part because of the, the nature of how um, the software that um, at least a couple of the school districts were using bring in the click data for, for us and the scheduling. Um, they do a data fresh once a day. So this is not being done real time. Um, there is a, the possibility and we talked about this on more you know, tactical reports of putting up a, um, a dashboard where we can stream the clicks from these devices and um, have a have a screen for the uh, teacher so he or she could be sitting in the front of the class and knowing um, exactly what page each student is clicked on at that given point in time um, but um, that's not been implemented at this point then let's see we've got other questions here. Sorry, let me redo this real quick. Okay. 
Okay, so this one is really a duplicate about the time lag. Um, this second one, another question we have here is what, um, regarding using Vertica for this. Um, you know, kind of part of part of the reason that again was um, you know, we, we had some experience with it. Um, but there's no doubt this could work exactly the same on other platforms. The, um, you know, the, the, the methods of pulling the analytics um, would be a little bit different, but you could definitely get to the, the same result. Um, we mostly chose that, it, again, because it has the ability to be either cloud or on-prem, and um, having the, some of the machine learning functions built in as you know, relatively simple selects. Um, was of interest to some of our clients, um, but there, 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 there are definitely plenty of other platforms that this would work on really just as well from an output standpoint, but um, based on this on our audience and requirements, that, that seemed like the best route to go, and to this point, they've been happy with it. Um, happy with it, although in one case, it's the only three Linux boxes they have in their environment, so there's a little bit of overhead with that. So I'll give us a few more minutes, um, or I'll give us another a minute if anyone else has any questions. Otherwise, uh, we can go ahead and wrap this up. Okay, well, in that case, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Hopefully this was um, somewhat useful. Um, and a little bit different use case than you normally see with some machine learning. Um, type functions. Uh, thank you very much for everyone attending.